Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. My background, uh, just uh, a brief introduction. My background is uh, I first started in the area of operating system, distribution system, and, and parallel systems. And then I became interested in um, building very large displays, building wall size displays. And when Jim was visiting me, he saw in the lab. Um, so I was interested in using cheap, inexpensive components, build displays that with a very uh, high resolution, you know, nice. Uh, look like a seamless image, and so you can visualize your data in a very large scale. And then once I start doing that, I s begin to be more interested in um, data. So uh, with my system background, I'm mostly interested in building systems, um, um, but um, mostly interested in now uh, content-based uh, similarity search of uh, non-text data types. Um, so those are my... Um, so Jill Wong is the lead grad student who did most of the work, which I'm going to uh, talk about. And, and on this project, mostly collaborate with Perry Cook, who does uh, computer audio and video, uh, com computer audio and music, and, and Matt is his student. Um, so um, this is a, under a bigger project, uh, working with my life base. It's a part of this project we call Content Aware Search System Project. Um, the, the primary goal is to, uh, first of all, not to invent new ways of doing feature extraction, and we're just going to leverage domain experts' uh, methods, like uh, what Dan and Alan talk about, uh, or Chris talk about, using their domain um, knowledge, you know, um, not recreating their knowledge, but leveraging knowledge and uh, try to build a scalable content-aware search system. And we're trying to solve the uh, system side of the problem you know, um, the problem with the content-based, uh, the non-text data types, especially data collected from sensors like a sense cam, that uh, the data are noisy, so you can't do exact match. You have to do similarity match. And uh, uh, the data structures we know in the past that currently built into the database, like MySQL, don't really work. You have to invent new novel data structures, new data index data structures, and so on. And you have to, um, um, the, the kind of language they're using for users I may, not be use, may, may not be usable. And I don't think we can afford for every data type to create a specific system that is agreeable by all people in that field. So it would be interesting to figure out what is the next generation of type of database we can use that can be customized to build our search engine for the non-text data type. So that's essentially our goal. But the initial goal is to just build a toolkit for people to use to construct their own search engine or search tools. And just like Mark said, <laughs> we like to make our things usable so you can create, you know, use in your own field, you know, make it a blown bigger. Um, so uh, the kind of things we're currently interested in is the study system building issues and novel data structures to to be able to do more efficient content-based similarity search. Then apply the toolkit to multiple kinds of data sets, um, whether it's a, just a single data, data type or data with a multiple modality. Then we try to integrate also with other systems, such as on my life base. Um, the current status, I'm just going to talk about the, um, since this is a 20 minute, I'm going to just give a very high level overview. Uh, we built a toolkit we're currently called Ferret. Um, so uh, we view this as an infrastructure for us, for our people in our project to evaluate different data structures and so on, but make it usable, usable enough so other people can use or other people may be able to, uh, to take and do their own thing. Currently, what we have done is to study uh, uh, the data structure related issues such as a sketch construction. Once you extract your features, we will make a, uh, internally we want to store as a tiny bit vector per data object as a sketch. 
I think a human actually think in terms of sketch, even though you don't consciously, you don't remember the details, you remember sketch, right? So with a sketch, you'll be able to estimate similarity. So the goal is to be able to reduce the metadata from even feature vectors down by order of magnitude. And then we also try to come up with a different uh, filtering and uh, indexing methods um, um, that's practical. You can actually use in the building systems. Um, we also try to uh, do some uh, more evaluation work. One of the things uh, my student has tried first was to do content-based similarity search on images. And then people have worked in images for many years. And then, but what we found is there was no um, good benchmarks you could actually use. And benchmarks were all created by the research teams, not by subject studies. So one of my students worked with a psychology professor and did a, um, um, did a subject study to create a benchmark. So we're going to publish that too so other people can use. And that's, uh, I think she uh, used about 80, uh, 80 subjects to do this study. Um, so we have to now try five data types, images, audio, video in the context of continuous archive data, 3D shapes, and the genomic microarray data. And we'll try, we're planning to try more. So let me go, go back to the, my life this. So um, uh, I really like the, uh, the vision of uh, uh, the Never Bush. Um, but I think the, the key part that challenging uh, for all of, all of us is uh, how to make the mimics be consulted with the exceeding speed and flexibility. And being able to record a lot of data is nice, but once you have years of recording, how to find information is probably the most challenging part. And I think a, a lot of uh, the today's database and many uh, infrastructure have given us the ability to do attribute annotation-based search. And that's very no nice, very useful. Um, but they have limitations. So the limit, uh, uh, what we are uh, interested in is to explore the possibility of introducing content-based uh, similarity search as one of the features um, into such infrastructure, but it work with uh, attribute annotation-based search and also clustering classification people have been working on and together. Um, then uh, the end goal is to uh, allow users uh, to do what the number Bush was talking about. Um, so, and uh, uh, currently we use the uh, Ferry Toolkit as the base to construct a toolkit and for this type of data. Uh, we just finished the prototype, you know, using those components, and we plan to integrate with a my life this. So I think. Uh, one of our unfair advantages of my uh, lead grad student did an intern with Jim, so he's familiar with my life based code. So if uh, there's a way we can work with, and uh, he will be, I would trust he will be able to do it. So let me just describe what these two components look like. Uh, so basically, there are three uh, kinds of components. One is uh, we call the core components. That does uh, the core similarity search portion also has a simple attribute-based search tool, which we can or cannot, you know, uh, we don't necessarily have to use it. We could use uh, MySQL database or other things. And then there's the metadata management component. And then uh, you can plug in, there's a plug-in interface, you can plug in your, your own feature extraction, segmentation feature extraction modules uh, of your invention. And you can describe what is your distance functions, for, you know, similarity measure. And then you, you know, for specific data type or data types. And also there are some modules customizable, uh, which include data acquisition where the data come in, like from uh, SenseCam, when we load into the system. And what do you invoke? There's a uh, API that you can invoke and get processed. And there's a web interface to just make it easier to use. Uh, uh, it's not professionally designed. Then there's a performance evaluation tool that allow you to uh, measure uh, how well you do uh, similarity search. So um, uh, the, the way we do, uh, if you look at the process when you submit a query, 
Um, the way we're, uh, we envision that people may use content-based search is that initially you actually use attribute-based search or annotation-based search. Unless you submit a, a time, a time range query. And then attribute search will uh, produce a result, you know, uh, some results. And that results will be cluster, you know, going through our clustering mechanism, we'll cluster it. This is just to help users to pick what clip of video they like to use as a query to do content-based search. And then with that, you issue the content-based query, and then content-based search will give you um, the results. So you can iterate multiple times going through this process. Yes? Can you distinguish what is the difference between attribute-based search and content-based search? I mean, are you, when you mean attribute-based, you talk about text? Is that what you uh, Attribute, I mean like a time, location, but annotation is something we label the data by hand. Okay. Yeah. Then classification to me is like automatic generation of annotation in some sense. No, because I would have thought that, you know, if you query by color and texture, texture and color also attributes of an image. Right. That... Yeah. I, I, I just call that um, features. I suppose attributes I, I thought would be the ones that's independent of data content. Okay. Like a time location are not content. But you can describe content, you, you as a, I call that attributes also. I think this uh, terminology case. And there, um, so in the content-based search, we, we build in a toolkit that um, you can deal with a multiple set of features per object. Like in video case, you have a visual and audio. But in, in other cases, you may have more than one set of features. Then for each set of feature you perform search, then there will be some kind of weighted ranking and merge the results and produce the final results. So if you look at the core search, um, uh, similarity search engine, what it does is that when the data object is coming in, and it will, um, do this segmentation feature extraction, you specify with a plug-in component. And that will do the, then we'll do a sketch construction and put a sketch into the sketch database. And then if you submit the query um, data object, it will go through the similar process, but then um, that will go through filtering, indexing um, to, uh, to put, produce a candidate set and then we do the similarity ranking. But uh, this is where the merge will happen. So you can, you can do uh, this kind of search for each set of features or each uh, um, modality, I would say, then, then you can do such a, a merge. So uh, the similarity search problem, that's, as we all know, is you know, if you have a multidimensional feature vector, uh, the simplest case, you just try to find the nearest the neighbor in the high dimensional space. That's the way we, we currently think. But the, the, the tricky part is to, um, um, the, I think there are two big challenges. One is that we don't really have a universal agreement on the definition of similarity because uh, um, it really should be based on human perception as opposed to your, our, your or <laughs> mathematical models. And I think the th second is that there are a lot of data which has a very high dimensionality, you know, high intrinsic dimensionality, and, uh, um, and then the theoretician called this curse of dimensionality that um, is just uh, um, difficult to design uh, efficient data structure to, to work on. And in our internally, I'll just give you a little bit internal represent, uh, representation of what we do. Internally, uh, for each data object, we actually, uh, uh, first, we allow to have a multiple type of features. So in this case, uh, visual and audio, each have different type of feature vectors. Each have its own weight. And then for each one of them, uh, you may have multi-dimensions, right? Each dimension may have a, uh, its own weight. So you have this two-level hierarchy. And um, for the content, uh, for video clip um, segmentation, um, I wish we have 
something better. So I, I could have used, uh, we could have used Allen's approach. But um, I think the ideally what you want is to be se segment continu continuous archive data into searchable, conveniently viewable clips, the boundary making sense for humans. Um, but we tried to, uh, uh, some set of known approaches that didn't work very well because they're all designed for commercial, well-edited videos. Just the, the same point Alan pointed out. So currently, we, we did a very naive approach, just equal length segmentation every five minutes. And so this is something we can definitely leverage somebody else's result. For visual feature extraction, uh, what we did is uh, for each clip, we will per, uh, we'll get sample 20 images out of each clip each, uh, every 15 seconds. It's, all, again, very simple approach. Then for each image, we'll uh, segment the image into regions using the JSEC uh, tool built by people at Santa Barbara. And then produce a 14-dimension feature vector that includes uh, things like color moments on bonding box and uh, bonding air, you know, the aspect ratio and something, you know, fairly simple. Then after that, we combine all 20 images into a virtual image that has a set of feature vectors, okay? And uh, then the similarity measure for the images, um, you know, when we compare trying to find similarity, similar cliffs are using EMD or earth mover distance. It basically, uh, what it meant, uh, a good analogy would be you try to move a pile of dirt to a different set of piles, and what's the minimum amount of work mass you have to move? And that's the kind of calculation you do. Um, for audio feature extraction, um, uh, also we're doing uh, for each segment of clip, uh, for each clip, we segment that into 20 audio segments, 15 seconds each. And and each will generate a 154 dimension feature vector. We're actually using the method, you know, uh, this is a based on, based on uh, dance method, actually. Um, he published it uh, two years ago. And, uh, and then our uh, Paris student uh, added in the KL uh, divergence uh, uh, features. And then, uh, uh, so in the end, you have three sets of a uh, uh, 25 uh, short features, and then plus two more, then you do both um, uh, average and the um, um, deviation, you know, or if you, you know, then you get 154 dimensions. The similarity measure here is the best one-to-one -one match based on the L1 norm or Manhattan distance. And so um, what we do in this toolkit is that uh, because EMD, if you choose to use EMD or some other uh, computationally intensive uh, method to, as a similarity measure, it takes too long to do search. So what we do is we first will do filtering, then using sketches that can go through very quickly, and then produce a candidate set uh, in milliseconds, and then with a candidate set, then we do ranking using EMD or some kind of weighted approach if you have multiple uh, sets of features. And after we construct this thing, and uh, we were trying to do some experiments, but um, SenseCam was delayed a little bit, so we decided we couldn't wait, so we bought the, um, um, the Deja View um, camware. Um, equipment, and uh, <laughs> the grad student recorded his life for, for six weeks. Then we use that to do, uh, uh, to do our initial evaluation. So, it's, uh, so there are two evaluation questions we're trying to answer. One is um, the quality of content-based search, um, and the second is uh, what the system resources consumed by doing this, and whether it fits in continuous archive data. How long can you deal with, you know, um, so um, out of the recording, um, he composed, a, he manually labeled um, 
subset of the clips. So some of them are used as training data set and, and the other used as testing data set. And he only marked them into pretty coarse granularity. Uh, you know, I think he could probably do more than that. Um, but this is uh, just a uh, beginning. And then uh, he would, uh, uh, the measure we currently use in, um, um, so far is to use average precision, which are consider uh, the ranking, not just the simple recall. And the initial results shows, uh, to answer those two questions are as follows. If you use a visual feature alone, and you get about uh, 0.59 um, average position. If you use the audio feature alone, you get 0.66. And if you do combine, uh, you do better. You do 0.88 in, you know, in this particular <laughs> initial benchmark. Um, so the search, search resources, um, uh, without using sketches, uh, he did a calculation that takes about one point, less than 1.4 gigabytes per year of video. So that's quite small. You can put all metadata in memory. Um, if you are using, uh, we, have a, we haven't done more work yet to show uh, uh, the sketch configurations, what work really well for this kind of data yet. Um, so sketches, we expect that to reduce to about 100 megabytes per year of uh, video. So, um, so what we have learned so far by uh, working on this uh, project at this stage, uh, I think what we have learned is uh, uh, it seems like content-based search can perform reasonably well with uh, continuous archive data, even with a very naive segmentation method. I think, uh, yeah, think you know, many, there are many areas we can improve. And the system research overhead is reasonably low. And, and the FAIR toolkit is fairly easy to use, so um, we uh, really ch try to um, release it um, soon. Um, now I like to do a demo. You know, since I'm from system, I don't worry about crashes. Um, we'll see whether that works. So, um, okay, so <laughs> this is the, the simple web interface um, that in the Ferret Toolkit. So if you construct, you'll be able to use something like this. Those are uh, the clips uh, he, uh, he, uh, he had. Um, there's a simple um, attribute-based search here. For example, if I search some range, uh, let's say, um, from May uh, 10th to June 10th, and I can search. Um, so those are the clips um, recorded during that range, you know, uh, over here. Yeah. Okay, good. Much better. So uh, as you can see that, you know, so this is the... Uh, the time range within that month, I, as I show. But then the toolkit will try to do the clustering. I think right now we're also using a pretty simple approach, just a simple k-means approach. And then you can go to the cluster to see whether those are the things you're interested in as the uh, query of, for content-based search. Or you can just take one of them. Let's say, let's take one of them. I, I, this looks like he's recording when he was meeting with me in my office. Okay, let's see how many are there such as this. So, see his camera is going up and down. And uh, also, this thinks that Moses' office is similar to my office meeting with him. As you can see, this is a way of, you know, doing, uh, performing this similarity search. And you can uh, currently, he's not hooking. This is an MPEG, but if you click, actually, what he did right now is just to validate um, um, because we have this simple. He just saw, saw some some sample clips 
uh, instead of playing and take video, you know, uh, um, um, using the using uh, in, invoking the Microsoft Player. So this is just a show 64 clips of the entire video sample in that time interval. So just to validate, this is a truly that recording because we have this really simple, you know, segmentation. Okay. So um, so that's uh, the demo. Uh, I also convinced him to get a, a demo running on my laptop for images. So I, may, I will just show you the same using the same toolkit. So this uh, I have about 8,000 uh, pictures on my laptop. Then um, um, in this case, uh, online you can actually use Google to do annotation-based search. And Google gives you the results, and using those results, um, uh, as the <laughs> to bootstrap your similarity search, or you can use one of them, the images here. So we, uh, let's use one of them here, and which one do you like to do? Yeah. Right, so you, mean you do a search on Google, yeah. you pick an image, then you're going to generate all the features for that image, and then use that to find similar? Yeah, in my database, on my desktop. Is that quick to analyze and get all the features? Yeah, that, that's so pretty quick. I mean, I can try to, to do this. Uh, no, no, no. I just, uh, yeah, I've, uh, let's say Snow, which I have done before. That's Google. Okay? So, how come it doesn't show anything? Blocking out. Doesn't work in this building. <laughs> you can't use Google. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Never, never mind. Let's choose one of the images. Which one do you guys like to, to search with? Which one? Um, which dog? This one? Or this one? This, this one? Okay. And this is the same as the other one, 14 dimension with a three, the first three color moments. So you have nine dimension, then you have this bonding box, you know, the area, you know, the... Uh, so, so, um, let's go back. And anything else you want to try? <laughs> See, since I'm in the demo mode, hmm? this one. Yeah. See many dogs in the snow. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Thank you. I, I have a question. Yeah. So I was really sold on what you had to say about scalability and Ben of our Bush saying that. What What is the key here to scalability? Is it what you said about not doing all the pairwise comparisons and having some method to avoid that? And what's the sort of overall right. trick to not having to do all those pairwise? Right. So we've been exploring two, two tricks. One is the sketch construction I mentioned. But you can... You know, so far, we, when we experiment with uh, the data types I mentioned, it's, in, it's not video we haven't tried yet. We haven't investigated further. But since uh, the features are uh, images and audio, I think the previous four covers uh, images and audio individually. I think uh, 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 the result indicate that you can shrink the metadata by order of magnitude and without losing much uh, search quality. Yeah. So shrink it by an order of magnitude, so it'll all fit in main memory. Right. And, and you still will do pairwise comparison. You do pairwise comparison when you do filtering, but in this case, our sketches use a Hamming distance to approximate L1 distance. So you, all you need to do is to figure out how many bits are different. And so you just go through your data structure, this bit vector, and that's what can be done very quickly. Um, so that's one one of the uh, direction we've been exploring, and we still try to understand. But, but sorry, and to be clear though, but that's a scan operation, right? It's a Is scan operation. Well, it's uh, making sense here because you're, if you're doing attribute search first, you have intermediate results, right? And so you actually don't have as many. You don't really filter the whole database. You just uh, uh, filter your intermediate results. If you do want to go back, even you have a, we've tried with a, 
uh, I think uh, the image database we currently have have about three million images. Even with that, it will come back in a couple of seconds. Um, so the second approach we've been exploring is uh, to first we try to understand uh, what people have proposed of various indexing data structures, including cover tree and various versions of a locality sensitive cache. Uh, hashing approach. And what we found is that cover tree uh, doesn't work well if the intrinsic dimension analysis is relatively high. Like for audio data, um, it doesn't really work well. Um, locality sensitive hashing is uh, the, uh, the current proposal so far is not practical because uh, you need almost like a, a few hundred hash tables and each hash table has uh, uh, the same number of entries as the number of data objects in your system. Um, so what we came up with is a, a way to, we called hash value perturbation based approach. So instead of having, let's say, 100 hash tables, let's just have 10. And each one, when you hash into the bucket, this is a locality sensitive hashing function. You hash into the bucket, then you alter one bit in your hash value that send you to a different bucket, your hash table. It, you know, this hash function has that probability, has a reasonable probability that the other buckets may actually have your data items in your neighborhood. And you do this many times, as many bits as you have in your hash value, it turns out this is a pretty reasonable approach. This will typically reduce your number of hash table by order of magnitude, and the time actually doesn't increase that much. Um, uh, in fact, the time is similar, and so so this is something where uh, we just experimented, and we'd like to put that into the toolkit. I think there, it is still a challenging question uh, how. Um, I mean, there, I'm sure there are other better methods to be discovered in the future, but those are the, the two kind of approaches we're taking to deal with the scalability question. So it sounds like the sketch, I was thinking when you said that, you know, human memory, you said human memory works kind of like that, and how inaccurate my memory is also. And a key distinction we all rely on in computers is, well, they may not be like a human, but they're always accurate. They get these, you know, these right. precise. Whereas it sounds like in order to gain scalability, maybe the answers back to the system will be more like a human. Yeah. So Look at these things, and the, the computer's answer, wow, well, it was kind of sketchily the same, you know. That's, right. And, and I didn't have the right sketch for that other one, so I didn't get it for you. Right. Yeah. Any? Have you considered, I know that you said with the ANM system, have you done more research on the cross computing thing? Because that is one strategy to get it cut down. Yeah, I mean we we are essentially do A and N. I mean, and no, uh, I mean the the uh, ANN is the ones that I know. Uh, Mario and Mark, this is very early research. This is on approximating the the distance function. The way that we can guarantee uh, we can guarantee right. within some epsilon within that sphere. Yeah. I don't know if you're doing that. Um, we have tried several approaches. You know, in fact, one of the key team members, Moses Charika, his work is in that space dimension reduction okay. space. And I think uh, uh, the, the key observation we have is that once you're uh, um, once you have the realization that uh, the only way to make a high, bigger impact is to be able to deal with the large data sets, and, and you really uh, shouldn't be constrained by your mathematical model, because the mathematical model is approximation to the reality of the human perception similarity, and then um, you can actually do a lot better. And that does the, so, so people just feel much, much have a lot more freedom to come up with a new way of doing things. I think uh, um, I think that's uh, if you if we look at the uh, tax-based search engine, um, 
you know, Alta Vista to you know, MSN, Google, and so on. Um, before uh, they start doing um, web content-based, I mean, uh, text-based search, um, you know, the uh, IR community has been around for probably 30 years. Um, but um, you know, only a few ideas actually could apply to what they do because, they're, because of their scale. You know, only the really fast algorithm could actually be used. You know, most of the other algorithms couldn't be because once you address large data set, something just didn't work. Sure. All right, thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank you.